The natural world has been in an arms race for four billion years. Evolving systems of strategy and structural design to survive and prosper. Pound for pound, size for size. Does technology square up to nature when it's time to face the enemy? I'll be more powerful than the Terminator. Is the armor of the future soldier as efficient and capable as the humble lobster? Is a tank crew under attack as relatively safe as a tortoise under attack? It's a constant competition between people who design missiles and people who design defences against missiles. Can nature inspire technology to make the world a safer place? Wildtech explores defense. Wearing your skeleton on the outside provides permanent protection. Like a medieval knight, carrying around heavy armor results in some minor inconveniences, but also some major advantages. The pangolin is nature's medieval knight. The only mammal with scales. Its armor is actually hair cemented together to form a tough outer shield, strong enough to deflect a bullet fired from 100 yards. In the search for bulletproof armor, the pangolin had the answer before bullets were even invented. Once guns became part of mankind's inventory of war, bulky body armor became ineffectual and obsolete. Soldiers paid the price in blood. Although had they known it, the answer may have lain in their breast pockets. There's several well-documented cases from the Wild West which show that in fact, in the old days where you used to aim to shoot for the other person's heart, Yet when uh, the person was examined afterwards, then you find that in fact that the bullet hadn't actually pierced the skin, it hadn't broken uh, through because the person was wearing a silk handkerchief in their breast pocket. The silk uh, handkerchief had actually stopped the bullet. The Japanese had already exploited the strength of silk. Made from caterpillars known as silkworms, the ruling warrior class of samurai were using silk armor as part of their martial arts attire. It's taken several centuries for the Western world to catch the thread. Scientists searching for a flexible bulletproof material have looked to a different animal to supply a stronger strand. Spiders. It's really a complete chemical engineering factory uh, in a single organism. Spiders created their basic silk recipe during the height of the dinosaur age and have stuck to it ever since. Within the spider's silk gland, proteins are dissolved in highly concentrated solutions. As they are pulled out by the spinnerets, the proteins unwind, lock together, and harden on contact with air to create elastic threads. It's five times stronger than steel of the same radius. Spider's silk is so strong that a silk cord the thickness of a pencil could stop a jet. But silk a few microns thick is all that's needed to capture prey. This bee first sticks to the web silk, then is wrapped in a cocoon. Silk becomes stiff when it stretches. The more the bee struggles, 
the tighter the bonds become. The ability to stretch and dissipate energy makes silk an effective buffer against bullets. The spider's attack mechanism becomes man's defense technology. There's two big problems with spiders. First of all, they're territorial, uh, and secondly, they're carnivorous. Uh, and really, neither of those makes it very amenable to farming. Milking such tiny creatures is no easy feat. Although a spider can produce 350 yards of silk in one session, it would take 20,000 spiders to produce enough silk for one flak jacket. But with the genetic revolution spinning us into a realm of new possibilities, scientists have been able to take the silk-making gene from the spider and insert it into another creature altogether. The nanny goat. Goats are hardly going to be spinning giant webs, but unlike the spider, they can be milked to produce great quantities. The technology to create spider silk from goats is happening naturally. Genetically modified goats spliced with spider genes create silk proteins that can be dissolved and extracted from their milk. Now you can imagine having a factory, if you like, a natural factory that will actually make this protein. Uh, you can then milk the animal, um, purify that uh, milk, and you'll end up with a powder that might actually look something like this. We can then actually dissolve this in a special solvent and then spin it into very thin fibers. It's not just the material and it's not just the fiber that's important, it's actually how you make the fiber that's important. In other words, how you stretch the molecules and how they dry. It turns out the best types of silk are spun in damp, dark places, such as the rainforest. Spinning slowly in a moist environment creates the strongest possible filaments. Now that's not how traditionally people have spun spider silk synthetically. They tend to spin it very rapidly, they evaporate the solvent, and that makes what we call a glassy material. So what we're doing is controlling that process so that you end up with very, very stretchy fibers. Such fibers will provide the next generation of body armor. We're aiming for something that's flexible enough that it's like an undershirt. So you can put it on, and instead of just protecting the torso, then it will also um, it lends some protection to the arms and the extremities. So maybe you can ultimately imagine long johns that are woven out of spider silk and other fabrics. Spider silk armor is still in development. The 21st century soldier will be stronger, lighter, and nearly indestructible. Armor may be getting lighter, but it's still cumbersome protection. Has uh, shoulders, just covers your shoulders. Has a small piece that comes up right here that covers a little bit underneath your armpit. It's got a neck protector, groin protector right here. And it has just the different pockets to carry all your different ammo and any other things that you would need for that. The Cobb County Police SWAT team are gearing up for an exercise. This armor gives police an edge in dangerous situations. Hey, what? but its applications are limited. It restricts mobility, can weigh more than 100 pounds, and leaves parts of the body exposed. This whole area is even more exposed. If he's got to check something up high, then he brings the father, he brings the weapon up, the more exposure you, you have in here. If there was a threat directly ahead of him, then you've got a gap in here. Mm -hmm. 
nature's armored defenders don't expose any parts of the body to danger. Like the SWAT team, the lobster uses armor to protect itself against predators, like sharks. The rigid restrictions of its shell protect the soft internal organs. Armor is the difference between life and death. All clear. Hard armor and brittle pincers protect it this time. But the lobster's shell isn't always such an impenetrable shield. In order to grow, it molts. The now soft-shelled lobster is at its most vulnerable, but not completely helpless. It sucks in water. The soft shell is now supported by internal hydrostatic pressure. The lobster has changed from hard armor to soft armor. It's the kind of innovation the military has been dying to get its hands on. Responsive armor covering the entire body, relying on reflex action to stiffen and deflect bullets like a kind of superhero. This is the future warrior. It's the combat uniform designed for war 2030. It represents an awesome leap forward in biomechanical engineering and nanotechnology, which will improve the chances of soldiers making it home alive. Compare the statistics from World War II to the 1991 Gulf War. Nearly half a million American soldiers killed to just 293. In future wars, protecting the individual is one of the primary objectives of battle tactics. Compared to the uniform that we wore in Afghanistan and that we're currently wearing in Iraq, this uniform will completely outdo it by 150%. What you see is how I'm gonna wear into combat. This prototype is currently under testing at the Natick Soldiers Center in Massachusetts. Its composition is a tightly kept secret. The uniform will protect me from chemical and biological attacks, as well as any element that Mother Nature can throw at me. Wind, fire, rain, snow, hail. They'll be able to protect me from it all. But where the future warrior is truly revolutionary is in its ability to change from soft fabric to solid armor, just like the lobster shell. This is something we're calling dynamic armor. And 90% of the time, it's gonna be in a gel state. The uniform will sense when danger is approaching, such as a bullet coming through the air and the vibrations it picks up through the air will instantly tell the suit, all right, it's time to turn hard, making the bullet fall off of you. I'll be more powerful than the Terminator. Lightweight, flexible, with a supportive exoskeleton, giving the future soldier increased mobility with heavier loads. Some of our more elite forces, the special operations guys, are carrying in excess of up to 200 pounds going into combat. The exoskeleton will allow me to carry in excess of 400 to 500 pounds with the ease of me only feeling like I'm carrying 15% of my body weight. The future warrior will also be smart. Local area internet network voice recognition, and video monitor, all located inside the visor. We're looking at having a local area network 
that's going to be linked into every single soldier within the team and within hire so that we'll be able to communicate across the battlefield, whether we're 10 feet or 10 miles away from each other. On the inside of the drop-down visor, we'll be able to display our tactical messages. It'll give us all of our necessary emails, graphics for the terrain we're fighting in, as well as other selected bits of information. When we go out to train, we'll be able to pull up actual training missions through the onboard computer system in the uniform and actually go through a city environment, uh, kicking down doors, going into rooms, and it'll all be displayed up on our visor. So technically, we don't even need the city anymore. We just need the uniform. When we go to combat, it's going to work the same way. These battle systems being developed by the US Army for the future warrior are taking individual soldiers into high-tech, high-information scenarios with wireless computer technology, biomedical systems, and advanced fabrics. Able to provide better defense against conflict 21st century style. The Urban War. Beetles are counted among nature's fiercest fighters, able to withstand a crushing onslaught. Armor not only protects these battling beetles, it gives them the strength of Goliath. Stag and rhino beetles can carry up to 800 times their body weight. That's the equivalent of a man carrying 160 tons. The key to their strength is the many layers of laminate that form like plywood. The most important layer in the insect skeleton is chitin, a protein made up of long molecules bound together in bundles. This gives the exoskeleton a unique combination of both strength and flexibility. Even more impressive, millipedes reinforce their armor by using calcium carbonate crystals, which makes them so tough they can support 25,000 times their own weight. The relative strength of the millipede outclasses technology's warrior of the war field, the tank. I feel safer inside a tank than anywhere I've ever been before. Unlike the millipede, the modern tank isn't likely to be crushed. Its enemy is the armor-piercing shell and the weapons of modern warfare. Armor on it is outstanding. The chemical protection system is outstanding. And there's nothing like firing that gun. The earliest tanks were protected by thick layers of steel, but steel alone is heavy and vulnerable. Modern tanks prefer a protective cover of Chobham armor. Its exact composition is a secret, but scientists recognize the value of interlayering. In the case of Chobham, ceramic material sandwiched between steel. The M1 tank has taken this a step further, adding a layer of depleted uranium between the rods. When hit by a shell or rocket, the ceramic shatters and absorbs the incoming energy. The inventors of Chobham armor may have thought they were onto a breakthrough. Its principles are echoed by the design of a tortoise shell, as this lion cub is about to discover. It may not be bulletproof, but it provides a solid shield against tooth and claw.
The shell is formed from three living, growing segments. In the center is a spongy layer containing spherical cavities, sandwiched between compact bone. Having a central layer that absorbs shock creates an impenetrable barrier. The cub finds the tortoise is better as a toy than a tasty morsel. Living in its own fortress, the tortoise has survived 150 million years of evolutionary change. Yet its basic blueprint has remained the same. Twenty-first century terrorism means the desire for protection extends beyond military use. At the Mercedes Armored Car Division, the latest models are put to the test. Various caliber weapons are fired at close range, including military-style bullets traveling at twice the velocity of handgun projectiles. The Mercedes armorers have also drawn from the lessons taught by the tortoise. This reinforced glass is made by layering a polycarbonate material between glass that has been fired at extreme temperatures. The matrix absorbs a bullet's energy and stops it. On the inside, it will look frightening, but it will be safe. Armored cars are also drawing on military technology. High-tech ceramic armor is used to coat limousines, just like a military tank. Demand for armored cars is strong in the Middle East and in the countries of the former Soviet Union. This is the car of Georgian President Edvard Shevardnadze. He walked away from a rocket-propelled grenade attack. The passenger compartment withstood the blast, allowing the president and his bodyguards time to escape before it burst into flames. The door would not open and I knew the car was going to blow up. It was burning in front and the back. At that moment, the driver had enough courage and intelligence to jump out of the car and break open the door from the outside. I was able to leave it, and in several seconds, the car exploded. The next generation armored cars under development by the U.S. military will employ a host of defense technologies to cater for every situation. In this dramatization, a U.S. embassy in a hostile country is under siege. A dramatic escape is required. This is the smart truck. Loading global positioning system. Go, go, go. The armored car for the 21st century. The whole chassis is super reinforced and able to withstand a multitude of attack scenarios. Engaging pepper spray. Engaging electrified door handles. Loading alternative coordinates. 
as a showcase for future technologies, the smart truck has few rivals. Behind you. Engaging laser turret. Lasers and weaponry of the smart truck exploit another key protective strategy used by the military. The best way to be defensive is to go on the offensive. defense against the enemy. There comes a point when the best way to defend is to strike back. Scientists at the Missile Defense Agency in Washington believe the best defense is accuracy. Their focus is one hit, one kill. They are developing single kill missiles, which have the intelligence to intercept an intercontinental ballistic missile mid-flight. Ideally, interception happens at either boosts phase when the rocket is accelerating out of the Earth's atmosphere, or a second phase, when the warhead is traveling in an arc through space. Defense strategists have realized missiles in second phase can easily deploy diversion tactics, separating into hundreds of individual targets, each one capable of carrying a warhead, impossible to destroy. Boost phase is considered the best chance of destroying a missile. By 2012, the next generation missile defense will be ready for testing. Jumbo jets armed with powerful lasers. An airborne laser will detect, locate, and direct a laser towards that target, engage the laser, initiating destruction of the, the ballistic missile itself. In a typical operation, ground and satellite intelligence would alert U.S. authorities of a hostile nation launching a missile. As intelligence would indicate that a threat could be taking place in the future, uh, these airborne laser systems would be put into a rotating pattern close enough so that they could engage a ballistic missile with the airborne laser system. Within minutes of a launch, a high-altitude 747 could position itself to be within range. A low-energy laser would lock onto the target, pinpointing the strike zone, directing the high-energy attack laser. All it needs to do is burn a hole in the side. No warhead is needed. There's no body-to-body -body contact that's required. That allows the ballistic missile to blow itself up. Laser defense still has hurdles. Missiles can be coated with laser reflecting paint or simply spin affecting the laser's ability to focus. And the warhead may not necessarily be destroyed or burn up in the atmosphere. It could land in unknown territory between the launch site and a target. The precision strike is one defense strategy. The other is to overwhelm. Mm -hmm. 
smaller animals are capable of overwhelming a large intruder by swarming. In this reenactment, they sting an attacker to the point where they nullify the threat. A technology called Metal Storm promises the same strategy. A cloud burst of bullets, which obliterates an incoming threat. If you have a missile coming in, you really want to rate a fire that can deal with that threat, and the, the faster that rate, the greater your chance of defeating that threat. Metal Storm is a gun, but unlike conventional guns, has no moving parts. It uses projectiles separated by propellant inside a tube. An electronic impulse fires the projectile. When you do ignite the propellant in front of a projectile, that pushes out the leading one, but the projectile immediately behind that, the high pressure forces on the nose of that projectile, and in our system, that projectile then expands and locks in the barrel very effectively. The difficulty with that is that then later you want to ignite the next lot of propellant to get it moving. So our system also has to incorporate a projectile that if you apply force on the nose, it locks and seals, but if you apply force on the butt, it unlocks and flies like a normal projectile. And in that way, we can fire one round and stop, or we can progress up to a very high uh, rate all the way down the barrel. Having no moving parts, the weapon allows a greater rate of fire than conventional ballistics. If we look at a nine millimeter submachine gun, Rates of fire in those areas vary from, say, 600 rounds per minute to about 1,000 rounds a minute. A single barrel, 9mm metal storm submachine gun can be fired at a rate in excess of 45,000 rounds per minute. But importantly, too, we're not limited to a single barrel. Most metal storm systems are operating on 16 barrels, giving a firing rate of a million rounds per minute. The multi-barrel mechanism dissipates heat. A conventional weapon would overheat and jam, or even melt. On military aircraft or ships, metal storm panels could be built to either destroy or protect. In this fighter operation, arrays are wing-mounted, the swarm of bullets taking out a missile installation. Although the impact is massive, the power requirements for this deadly weapon are trivial. A metal storm system like the one mounted to this Apache helicopter could run on just flashlight batteries. Bullets can be fired either in waves or overlap in flight, just like swarming bees. No moving parts, no magazine, just a tube, ammunition, and electrical lead. So the mechanical element of it disappears, and it does take us into fully electronic operation. The electronics also allow superior security locking systems, tailoring the gun for individual users. Critical to prevent unauthorized use of the Metal Storm handgun. Unlike conventional handguns, its ultra-rapid rate allows multiple rounds to be fired before recoil drives the weapon off target. 
combining accuracy with overwhelming firepower. No defense system is foolproof. But the Nelson guy. When you can't stand and fight, deception and retreat may be the best strategy. When confronted by the enemy, sometimes the best strategy is to simply disappear. Camouflage is one of the best forms of defense, as nature well knows. Just like a soldier hiding among vegetation, the decorator crab dresses in seaweed to blend into the background. Camouflage of the future soldier will rely on advanced fabric technology to create uniforms that chameleon-like change pattern and color. Even as the soldier moves through terrain. Whatever terrain I might be in, it'll be able to project on one side what it sees on the other side and vice versa all the way around the system. So when you're actually looking at me, you're looking at the tree that's standing behind me or you're looking at the bush that's to the right of me. Small cameras or light sensors embedded in the uniform monitor surrounds. Fibers impregnated with color change chemicals react to small electric currents. And the soldier blends into the background. Nature has other defense strategies which technology is discovering. The decoy. When cornered by a centipede, skinks have a remarkable decoy mechanism. They sacrifice a tail to save their skin. The more the tail wriggles, the more likely the predator will keep its attention on the decoy, giving the skink a chance to escape. A new tail will eventually grow back. So it's a fair price to pay to live another day. The Skink's decoy strategy has inspired a new piece of military hardware devised by the Australian Navy as a means of distracting incoming fire on a warship. When an enemy missile is detected, the ship must decide which strategy to use in order to avoid a direct hit. As weapons become smarter, keeping ahead of the enemy is the name of the game. It's a constant competition between people who design missiles and people who design defences against missiles. And as time has gone by, some of those traditional methods of missiles and guns and chaff and electronic jamming have become less effective. And we identified the requirement to have something else in the defence of the ship to take over that gap. Watch it, Nelson engage, 350. Don't engage. Seek ahead, D353. The next generation of anti-missile decoys is Nulka, a fully autonomous flight vehicle powered by a solid fuel rocket. Incoming missiles are looking for a ship. So the challenge for Nulka is to present a radar echo, if you like, that is bigger, more attractive than the ship itself, but is still very attractive to the missile and looks like a ship. Old HPG 65 bearing 354 and the seat head bearing 353. As it hovers away from the host ship, Nulka emits a radar signal that seduces the incoming missiles. Just like the lizard dropping its tail. It is able to generate signals that are so ship-like and, and so large, if you like, that the ship is, allowed to, is able to sneak away from it. Like a decoy, really. Closing. Down. 
luring the missile off course, Nulka's powers of seduction are so compelling, the ship can slip away. The clear and present danger passes. No defense system is foolproof. A nuclear attack or a catastrophic natural event would render decoys useless. When all else fails, it's time to take cover and head underground. When a threat is so great, it cannot be defeated. The safest option can be to hole up, wait till the danger has passed. For man, the last stand is the bunker. And the height of bunker mentality was the Cold War. Fallout shelters were prevalent not only in our country, but they were prevalent as 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 the the, the nuclear uh, threat spread throughout the world. And after uh, after uh, uh, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki again, uh, the 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 atomic world and the nuclear world was really uh, upon us. And so again, a degree of protection was needed. Hiding deep below ground becomes a last stand defense option. Though for nature, it's not so much a cold war as a war against cold. For the prairie rattlesnake, the underground bunker is home for up to six months of each year. By balling up together in large numbers, the snakes reduce heat loss and are safe from above ground attackers. As their metabolic rate drops, the snakes go into a state of suspended animation. This way, they survive the winter with no food nor water. One of man's more elaborate bolt holes is a remarkable facility four hours drive from Washington. Hello, welcome to the Greenbrier. The luxury Greenbrier Resort held a secret most guests would never have imagined. Dug into the very bedrock of the hotel is a hidden bunker designed to house 1,000 members of Congress It's a working and living environment where the legislative branch of government could have come to and been self-contained and sustained life for a period of 45 to 60 days and could have continued with essentially the business of government. Built between 1958 and 1961 by the Eisenhower administration, the aim was to create an impenetrable self-contained complex buried deep underground. On-site director was Fritz Bugas. The on-site director was simply the, the manager supervisor of 15 government employees. My overt role was that of, of regional manager of an outfit called Forsyth Associates. Forsyth Associates was our cover company. The 15 employees, the government employees, all belonged to Forsyth, and we provided audio video support to the hotel. And we, in fact, did that. Secrecy was the paramount issue in terms of, of constructing the facility, in developing the plans. Everything from the architectural design, the engineering aspect of it, uh, of constructing it and, and maintain and operating it, secrecy was the overriding factor in, in, in everything. In a national emergency, Congress would flee to the Greenbrier bunker and the 25-ton door would be sealed.
once you come through that door, you go left or right, male or female, depends. And as you move around and swing through these doors, you're going to get rid of any sort of contaminated clothing that you might have, literally stripping. As you strip here, your clothes would go into a cloth bag behind this door, drop into the bag. Once the bag is full, it's tied up, and that bag would be burned downstairs. Then we would take a shower that remove any sort of radioactive contaminants that might still be on your body. Here you would be issued fatigues, coveralls, things of that nature, of a unisex nature, uh, deck shoes, etc., uh, etc. Et we had enough clothing here to take care of a thousand individuals. The subterranean complex has a dormitory that could sleep 1,200 people, a medical clinic, and a surgery, and a cafeteria that could feed 400 people at a time. The congressional hideaway even has its own Senate chamber and presidential briefing room. This is the heart and soul of the whole facility. Without this, of course, you, you couldn't exist in here. This provides us the air, it purifies the air, it distributes the air, etc. It provides your emergency generation throughout the whole facility. At the peak of the Cold War, the United States could sustain 5,000 people in similar facilities around the country. The tiniest fraction of the population. Relocation sites are still in operation today across the United States. The location of many of these bunkers is classified. Whether these facilities can protect mankind from ultimate Armageddon remains unknown. Hopefully, this will never be tested. Defense of an individual soldier. Defense of a head of state. Defense of the planet. For every defensive scenario, nature has been there before, developing the very tactics which man has borrowed and technology mastered. It's the laws of nature applied to every level of existence. Whenever there is a threat, there will always be a defense to match. <laughs>